Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, final uh, COVE Research Inclusion and Innovation Speaker Series uh, for the semester. Um, my name is Dr. Jorge Figueroa Flores. I'm the Associate Dean of Research Inclusion and Innovation uh, for the College of Professional Education. And, and we're very happy today and, and have the distinct honor of having a great colleague, uh, Dr. Joanna Wong, uh, who is an associate professor of elementary education at California State University, Monterey Bay. Uh, as an elementary education literacy teacher with over 14 years of teaching and learning with diverse students in public elementary school, Joanna has worked in service of asset-based socially just literacy education across multiple contexts. And her research interests include culturally and linguistically sustaining writing pedagogy, critical literacy education, by literacy education and asset-based teacher education for culturally and linguistically diverse uh, learners. It is an honor uh, to present a great colleague, Dr. Joanna Wong. Joanna, the floor is yours. for inviting me to present and talk to all of you. And I'm grateful that you're all here today. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right. And um, so in my talk, I'm gonna go ahead and share several research projects through which I have been able to develop, um, facilitate and study teacher inquiry processes to support pre-service and in-service teachers to take an asset-based approach to literacy teaching. So I'm gonna start off by just highlighting some education issues that um, you know, ground the, the work. Um, so how teachers view the learning potential of their students and all their diversity is an essential component of effective teaching and a pressing social justice issue for teacher education. Teachers' implicit biases and larger institutional biases shape assumptions of learners' capacities and teachers' responsibilities. In the US, a deficit pers a perspective persists among teachers who are predominantly white and monolingual, coupling bilingualism and English language development with assumptions about intelligence and racialized multilingual students' learning capacity. Against this backdrop, preparing teachers to develop a, a critical lens to identify educational inequities and to locate and leverage all students' resources and learning potential are central projects for teacher education. Learning to discover K through 12 students' diverse assets, experiences, knowledge, and ways of engaging, understanding, and learning can form the foundation for culturally and linguistically sustaining instruction that's tailored, right? Um, and to counter deficit-oriented pedagogy and policies that have too long perpetuated educational iniquities for minoritized children and youth. For new teachers, such discovery work is exceptionally demanding, right? It, in these spaces where racial, ethnic, and linguistic identities often mark youth as deficient rather than capable. So moving from a deficit to asset-based focus on diverse learners is particularly salient and complex work with linguistic diversity, or when linguistic diversity is in focus and within a US social political context where bilingualism among racially minoritized students remains contested yet valued for white students. Pre-service teachers and in-service teachers uh, need opportunities to move beyond such deficit thinking and towards criticality that includes problematizing a monolingualism norm and examining schooling practices that perpetuate the marginalization of culturally and linguistically diverse learners. Too often, however, teacher, ed, um, teacher education responses have featured abstract or essentialized notions of asset-based pedagogy and diverse children and youth. Such fixed versions may foster a methods fetish um, with emergent bilingual learners with too little attention to variations among learners, their unique assets and needs and tailored responses. On the other hand, abstract versions of responses have not gone far enough in situating an asset-based approach for actual K through 12 students. 
The field needs more inquiry into processes and tools that guide pre-service teachers in acquiring an asset-based lens on learners while ensuring processes and tools are explored with real K through 12 students. Teachers, um, teacher educators themselves need guidance in preparing asset-oriented teachers. The work requires ample opportunities to reflect on and analyze emerging patterns, understandings about linguistically diverse learners, and appropriate pedagogy and may benefit from development of flexible protocols and tools to guide pre-service and in-service teachers' engagement with these issues. One way in which my research has sought to address these issues is through facilitating critical asset-based teacher inquiry projects. In collaboration with Dr. Stephen Athanasis at UC Davis, I am researcher on asset-based teacher education with linguistically diverse students. Um, and this is a um, teacher ed program um, at a university uh, working with secondary ELA credential students. Separately, I am primary investigator on three projects working with elementary in-service teachers with a focus on language and writing instruction for emergent bilinguals and culturally diverse students. The conceptual framework for this program of research on critical asset-based teacher inquiry is informed by social cultural theories of language and literacy, drawing on Penny Cook's work on language and literacy practices as locally situated contextualized practices. Um, Smargarinsky reminds us to trouble notions of best practices to situate literacy teacher ed within the local social cultural historical context. Uh, to address educational inequities, teacher education must prepare teachers who employ culturally and linguistically sustaining pedagogy that is reflective of the local context. Um, this research program's approach to teacher education through inquiry fosters pre-service teachers and in-service teachers development of deep knowledge of students through noticing, um, developing knowledge of content and teaching situated within the classroom and local school community. So our study sought to understand how pre-service teachers might develop an asset-based focus on linguistically diverse learners. This is particularly important as deficit perspectives of racialized multilingual students persist in K through 12 education. This pattern may contribute to lack of challenging goal setting, especially for uh, minoritized youth, supporting a culture of low expectations. This framing is deeply entrenched in uh, educators' conceptions of learners and learning, which has been highly resistant to reform. Such approaches often enact an ideology of remediation with minoritized students assumed to be deficient, needing repair. To counter such deficit perspectives, our teacher inquiry work centers asset-based frameworks on racialized multilingual students. So grounded in theories of um, asset-based pedagogies, including Ladson Billings work on cultural relevant teaching, um, funds of knowledge and uh, culturally sustaining pedagogy. As Paris uh, explains, culturally sustaining pedagogy requires educators to support young people in sustaining the cultural and linguistic competence of their communities while simultaneously offering access to dominant cultural competence. That is, culturally sustaining pedagogy seeks to perpetuate and foster to sustain linguistic, literate, and cultural pluralism as part of the democratic project of schooling. We feature teacher noticing to foster an asset-based orientation to learners. In the case of linguistically diverse learners, a teacher may use myriad forms of documentation and inquiry data to attend to what students are doing. Um, but also how they interpret language use and student performance and interactions in classroom activity may be informed by their orientations to students learning and language. This may be particularly salient when students perform language that does not align with notions of standardized English construction. In this way, teacher learning to focus on student thinking and performance is, is critical. But learning to interpret student language and thinking may be essential in developing student-focused and responsive instruction. Thus, asset-based assessment must account for students' expansive language and literacy practices and continue development with critical application of these processes. 
So teacher inquiry, um, I draw on the work of Cochran Smith and Lytle to inform my oops, definition of teacher inquiry. So teacher research refers to the inquiries of K through 12 teachers and prospective uh, teachers and often in collaboration with university-based colleagues and other educators. Teacher researchers work in inquiry communities to examine their own assumptions, develop local knowledge by posing questions and gathering data, and in many versions of teacher research work for social justice by using inquiry to ensure educational opportunities, access, and equity for all students. In inquiry communities, teachers jointly build knowledge by examining artifacts of practice, but they also interrogate their own assumptions, construct new curricula, and engage with others in a search for meaning in their work lives. So this interrogation of their own assumptions is actually a very critical and core practice um, to shifting toward asset-based perspectives and pedagogies. Learning to teach linguistically diverse students calls for sustained teacher learning opportunities that teacher inquiry may provide. Inquiry holds promise for transforming an equitable educational context if focused on asking critical questions about the learning of actual students and classes prompted by intentional systematic work, guided by reflective practice, and supported by flexible tools and processes that foster teacher agency. Um, and so this process includes data gathering, analysis, and reflection that can help practitioners better understand and serve their students' linguistic and academic needs. So the overarching research question across um, projects is in what ways and to what degrees do pre-service and in-service teachers use inquiry processes and tools as dialogic spaces and mediational tools to explore an asset-based focus on culturally and linguistically diverse learners as they engage with language-intensive English language, English language arts focal content. And so I'm um, gonna provide a brief overview of one of the projects. This is uh, in collaboration with Dr. Stephen Athanasis um, on asset-based learning and teacher education with linguistically diverse students. And so the context of this study is a California university program. Um, it is a secondary ELA credential program with 23 pre-service teachers who formed seven inquiry groups. Um, the pre-service teachers taught in extremely diverse uh, middle and high schools in urban, rural, and suburban contexts. And um, they served a very diverse um, population of students, as you can see here. Um, and, many multilingual uh, learners as well. And so in table one, you can see that this is a table that, sh um, that shows a range of knowledge sources um, that pre-service teachers tapped across a 10-week period of the inquiry and the varied analytic actions that they took as they engaged with sources and data. For example, um, the, after the pre-service teachers formed inquiry groups based on their um, topic area around literature. They explore literature, they um, engage with local instructional resources, um, and then they examine student work across time, right? Um, and so data included standardized assessment information. Um, they also presented profiles of four focal students who represented, who were linguistically diverse learners, really uh, learning about their, um, their academic and language backgrounds or ethnic backgrounds, um, ex observing their interactional patterns, and then also going deep and learning more about the students through focal student interviews and analyzing student work um, in holistic ways. And so you can see here uh, in the focal student interviews, they inquired about students' literacy practices outside of school, their reflections on class activities, their understanding of assignments, um, challenges, successes. And they also were asked to give feedback to pre-service teachers on their instruction. Um, and so the pre-service teachers memoed about um, what they learned. They coded these interviews and they displayed and described emerging patterns. And so learning directly from learners about their own teaching and then using that learning to provide additional supports and scaffolds is um, critical to really providing um, you know, responsive instruction. Some other key components um, in the culminating stage of the inquiry work here is 
this inquiry group chat, which occurred in week nine. Um, and so with peers in a topical group, uh, they met uh, and discussed an audio tape, uh, their, we, we call it a chat, um, uh, about to reflect on focal students' learning, challenges, assets, and really think about openings for next steps and future growth. And this was supported by a protocol with several prompts to guide discussion and reflection. And then the culminating activity was a symposium where inquiry groups presented their learnings and findings and next steps. And they were uh, pushed by um, uh, my collaborator, who's a primary instructor for the course, to really think about also um, learner assets in this discussion. So I'm going to highlight some learnings that are centered on two focal pre-service teacher inquiry groups here. Uh, the first is Group A, Conceptualizing Analysis and Student Writing. This group consisted of four pre-service teachers, two middle school and two high school teachers. Their instructional focus was teaching novel units with literary analysis as a summative task. The challenge they identified as the focus of their inquiry was students struggled with analytic writing. And their goal was to attend to student strategy development to generate cohesive analytic responses. The second focal group focused on identity and narrative writing. And so this group consisted of three pre-service high school teachers. Their instructional focus was to use a range of texts um, that were culturally sustaining to conduct mentor text studies. The challenge that they were facing was engaging students in acts of identity exploration, moving beyond traditional academic uh, types of literary works. Their goal was to engage students in literary works to spark their own explorations into character and their own identities. Um, thus, the larger goal was to be able to really tap into and access uh, learners' funds of knowledge through learning about their self-identities. Uh, and so here is um, one representation of some of the findings. And so this is our coding of themes and pre-service teachers memos on focal student interviews. And so um, this is one way in which the pre-service teachers were able to really identify and start really thinking about learner assets as they were uh, getting to know students more intimately through one-on-one -on -one interviews. And in this first, um, so I just highlighted a couple of themes I'm just gonna address. The first one is really kind of seeing the learner um, and moving beyond um, the idea of just uh, completing tasks, right? And so I'm gonna read this quotation. Given that my students were so self-aware about their growth, and their successes with this assignment, it should come as no surprise that they were also self-aware enough to identify their difficulties. Um, and so one important element of the interview was having students reflect on their strengths, but also identifying areas where they were, uh, they were challenged, um, right? And so this information is really important for teachers to have. Uh, and then so also another theme was uh, teachers identifying students' assets, their competencies, skills, and resources looking beyond the surface. While he didn't use terms like commentary or analysis to describe what he was talking about, I couldn't have agreed with him more. His analysis was one of the strongest in the class and strongly supported the claim of each of his paragraphs. And so here, the pre-service teacher is commenting that even though this focal student that he's interviewing isn't using dis uh, disciplinary terms, he's able to see the strength in his work by really focusing in on the ideas. Right, that he's representing in his writing. Um, and then another theme was learning about learners' preferences through the focal student interview. And so uh, this pre-service teacher noted how um, they learned that students found the templates really helpful um, because it really explained to them what the expect expectations were for the assignments, um, especially for the emergent bilingual students. And then finally, I'm gonna highlight one more is um, on the bottom here where it says support assets. Um, so pre-service teachers also uh, glean from the interviews ways that they could really uh, provide additional support, right? To really tap into and support learners' assets. I feel there is a way to create more buy-in for Derek so that he demonstrates his personal strengths and feels positive about his work. Perhaps his difficulty with conceptualizing and writing analysis is related to his interpretation of teacher feedback, which is something I will continue to scaffold 
alongside my continual instruction of analysis. So this pre-service teacher here is really reflecting on the learning from this interview and seeing ways in which they could um, further provide support um, and shifting away again from positioning the you know, students as deficient, but really seeing idea, um, opportunities for themselves to grow as teachers and support students better. In week nine, uh, pre-service teachers met in inquiry groups to report, analyze, and reflect on their inquiry work and student learning um, in these inquiry um, chat groups. Pre-service pre teachers had a list of prompts that they could use flexibly to gather, discuss, uh, to gather discussion. In the conceptualizing analysis group, there were two instances when peers challenged one of the PSTs, Dan, who stated beliefs and interpretations of student behavior that constrained his analysis of learning issues that students actually faced. Um, so this was in response to the second prompt, which was to identify you know, challenges students face. Dan here reported that his students, um, following up with another pre-service uh, pre teacher, Brenda, um, they both reported that students were not engaged in analysis. Brenda had explained how her students were unprepared to analyze text in the ways that she expected. And her response was that she was going to provide them with more instructional supports. Um, however, Dan interpreted uh, this idea of challenge differently. He referenced his focal students who were classified at varying levels of English language proficiency. Three of them were Spanish speakers and one a native uh, Russian speaker. Uh, and so here he says, it was the end of the year and my kids were so checked out that two of my focal students just didn't even try. And where I was asking for analysis, they would just put like IDK, I don't know, or a question mark. Um, they would just leave it blank. Two of my focal students just wouldn't even pay attention during the reading. And it was pretty simple. Just listen to the audio and follow along. And I had to stop the audio so many times and ask them, we're going to wait until everybody's eyes are on the book. And then I would ask like, what page are we on? And then kids would say, and I try to get them back on track. So just being mentally checked out was definitely a challenge. Melinda probed on students' audiobook engagements. How do you know that they were mentally checked out? because sometimes they'll just nod and li they'll listen and nod. Dan responded, they were just being defiant. Here, Dan interpreted the problem as disengagement and defiance. Unlike Brenda, who realized she needed to provide more instruction. Dan found his much younger students who were seventh graders also had challenges with analysis. However, his focus on behaviors impeded his capacity to view his students as capable of engaging and learning from a relevant activity. And Melinda, also teaching seventh grade, wondered if Dan's interpretation that students were checked out foreclosed potential adaptive teaching and student learning. In this instance, Dan did not shift his thinking despite Melinda's attempt to reframe students' actions in a more positive light. And so this um, theme in our findings was that also within the inquiry group, um, the pre-service teacher sometimes challenged another's ideas um, about, about pedagogy. And so during reflections and response to the prompt about uh, data analysis trends over time, Dan reported a trend. I noticed that like when I phrase questions differently, it changed the way they analyze stuff. What is the significance of this moment? When they would kind of freak out over the word significance, it's a big word. They don't really understand it. So then I, for my third data set, I just said, okay, describe why this part is important to me. And then they were able to do that a lot easier. So I think just phrasing questions like, I saw different trends or I saw um, improvement in their ability to analyze. Because I think when you tell them to analyze, they don't really quite understand it versus describe why something must be important. Brenda reinforced Dan's interpretation, but added an important dimension. Yeah, and I've been thinking about that lately. It's important to have the student-friendly language, but also like important to sprinkle in the academic language and make those connections between the student-friendly language and the academic language, because that is the language that they're, they're going to see on the standardized test, right? Yeah, absolutely. Here, pre-service teachers reported learnings about students' language knowledge and implications for teaching. This dimension of pedagogical language knowledge is salient to teaching linguistically diverse learners. 
a knowledge base pre-service teachers were developing through shared reflection. Brenda brought to light attention with simplifying language to make content comprehensible without simultaneously increasing language learning opportunities. Her rationale for academic language instruction reified an assessment focused value reflective of the macro context of schooling, rather than frame it as an issue of developing students advanced literacy resources or providing access to the culture of power. Nonetheless, she used a chat space to surface a relevant tension in guiding students multiple use of language. We found overall that group inquiry supported an asset based focus on diverse learners. Um, however, there were variations in, um, in their trajectories for each of the pre service teachers in their uptake of different processes. So with group A, um, the conceptualizing analysis and student writing group, the pre service teachers who attended to content and knowledge of students early on had the greatest success in gradual release and promoting students in independent skill development and really considering students um, with an asset based perspective. Brenda was uh, one of the PSDs. She was focused um, very much on using this T bear essay structure as a formulaic approach to writing. However, through her work with peers in the inquiry group, she started to learn from them um, and their exploration of tools, her research and close analysis um, about how to integrate more uh, assets into writing instruction. However, as noted previously, Dan had stayed fixed on um, particular structures and routines and was not yet able to try on this lens of asset-based framing of students. Um, as we saw earlier, one group member called them out in a moment of deficit framing. So we see that you know, um, pre-service teachers as teachers are on you know, different trajectories of growth um, and responding to processes and protocols in different ways. For group B, um, the group that was focused on uh, students writing exploring self-identity through reading narratives. Um, they collectively, uh, through their analysis of student work, rejected the writing rubric that you know, um, you know, came with their curriculum um, because they found it too restrictive, right? And um, it countered their purpose of embracing themes of multicultural identity. So they pushed, they were pushed by learner interests towards more expansive pedagogy, um, and again, they demonstrated variations in their use of developing learner knowledge in service of reframing and expanding their, um, their teaching um, practices. For example, Nadine, one of the pre-service teachers also was very much fixed on using the T-Bear structure for essay writing. However, in dialogue with partners, she also began to see rich and nuanced ways in which group members were letting go of these trappings of a formulaic approach to writing and using the rubric as a tool for teaching writing. And so she was then shifting to deeper engagement with um, nuances of multicultural identity development. While we saw Nadine continue to struggle with notions of T-bear use, she was starting to take on a very critical perspective. Um, she wanted to historicize and know why are we using T-bear at her school site? Um, so she was not yet able to let go um, and adapt the tool, but she was starting to question these practices of standardization. So, some, um, so the study highlights affordances of inquiry to create a rich teacher education context that goes beyond methods. Right? Um, through shared exploration, examination, and reflection, pre-service teachers engage in learning about diverse learners through tools beyond standardized assessment measures. Their inquiry process offered multiple opportunities to explore ways of learning about students through an asset-based lens, to humanize linguistically diverse learners, and develop equity-focused pedagogy. Such processes required pre-service teachers to engage in a complex integration of multiple knowledge sources as they develop learning about students, content, and pedagogy. The teacher inquiry processes of our study fostered pre-service teachers' agentive decision-making um, critical to advocacy and teacher activism for educational equity, culturally linguistically sustaining pedagogy as well. Um, and so again, noting that you know, um, pre-service teachers were on different 
you know, trajectories of growth, but we also saw that many were able to move into more um, expansive um, pedagogical decision making. So now I'm gonna shift to talk about a current research project um, that I'm knee deep in right now. It's writing from the heart, teacher inquiry into culturally sustaining pedagogy. Uh, and so um, we started this project in July. And so I'm the primary investigator and facilitator of professional learning. I'm working with seven elementary educators. They're all at the same elementary school. This includes a school principal, the instructional coach, a resource teacher, and one teacher from uh, K, first, second, and third grades. Uh, they come from, uh, they represent a range of demographic backgrounds. And the elementary school that they work at is primarily Latinx with um, 86.3% of students identified as Latinx and 70.2% um, receive free or reduced lunch. And over a third of the students are emergent bilinguals identified as English learners. And uh, a third of the, um, those students or of the students entirely um, are majority Spanish speakers. And so again, kind of sharing about the first processes, right, um, in terms of thinking about asset-based learning is really developing a deep knowledge of learners, right? Um, and so the uh, teacher participants have been interviewed, have interviewed their students to learn about their interests, backgrounds, um, and then also reflecting on what patterns of their learning and then how are they going to apply what they're learning about students you know, to their teaching. And so this is an initial interview um, with students and later on they will be interviewing based on, specifically on writing to learn um, about, you know, uh, students perceived strengths around specific writing and then also to learn um, for teachers to learn from students what they can do to provide them with more support and scaffolding. This is a, a tool that we're using right now to analyze uh, different, um, assessments of student learning and work. And so um, really thinking about noticing for patterns in students' languaging use, right? And um, looking across different types of language structures, and then really kind of moving to shift um, teachers to really think about the assets. What are the gems you see in focal students' writing? Right? Too often, uh, we are kind of conditioned to look for errors, right? Um, and so it's really important to really intentionally ask to look for strengths and gems, and then really identifying uh, and, and envisioning students growing and what potential do you see for further development. So some resources that we have um, used so far to really kind of build this framework of, of asset-based pedagogy, uh, around uh, towards you know, um, and framing of racialized and multilingual students. So we started in July with several sessions uh, to really kind of interrogate our, our assumptions about learners and curriculum. And we read and discussed uh, Dingo Paris's essay on culture sustaining pedagogy. We've um, read and um, discussed and made connections to curriculum with Goli Muhammad's Cultivating Genius text. And more recently, or throughout this period of time, we've also been really thinking about um, language ideologies and racial linguistic perspectives. And so um, using this chapter by Mar uh, Dr. Margarita Gomez and Christina Lo Collins, um, who gets to count as emerging bilinguals, adopting a holistic writing rubric for all. This comes from Nelson Flores, Amelia Singh, and Nicholas um, Serbatulu's uh, text, Bilingualism for All. And then also exp expanding this thinking about translanguaging and Black English in writing with Alice Lee and um, Laura Hansfield's article here. And so I present this because it really is framing a lot of the thinking um, that the teachers are doing right now to shift toward a more asset-based framing of students' linguistic backgrounds and assets. So here are some preliminary findings. Um, from the study, uh, I highlight some themes right now that are emerging, and I'm just going to talk about a few of them, the ones I bolded in yellow. Uh, and so one of the themes is around uh, tensions with wanting to affirm and value students' cultural linguistic backgrounds and identities, but still holding um, uh, onto the standard English ideologies and the concerns that that raises. 
about you know teaching students effectively. Um, at the same time, while teachers are grappling with these tensions, uh, we're see I'm seeing an emerging racial linguistic perspective among um, the teachers. And relatedly, they're starting to really engage in critical reflection, really connecting power and society and languaging and race. Um, also, in terms of pedagogy, teachers who, are, who have really started to shift and centering students' backgrounds and languages in their writing are seeing high levels of, of engagement. Um, all of the participants of this project have um, explained that they don't feel confident with teaching writing, that they have been underprepared to teach writing. And so um, this study really approaches pedagogical content knowledge and also really um, addressing you know, language knowledge and, and linguistic beliefs. And so uh, consequently, um, teachers are expressing an increased confidence in teaching writing. So I'm gonna talk about this uh, emerging theme here that is surfacing this tension of wanting to affirm and, and value students' cultural linguistic backgrounds, but um, this is in tension with standard English ideologies. Uh, and so in July, Dr. Margarita Gomez presented her study to our group, she was a guest speaker, on the use of translanguaging in a Spanish-English dual language after school writing club, where she invited students to write using their full communicative repertoires, including Spanish and Black English. Students in, um, included Black language speakers um, who were learning Spanish in, in her group. She introduced concepts about asset-based assessment to give credit for students' use of translanguaging and writing. She led us through a coding system that she used to describe ways um, in which students were translanguaging and drawing on linguistic rules from their primary language to really uh, show an asset-based approach to, to um, seeing the ways in which students were um, using language and literacy in their writing. And so one of the teachers in, uh, in my group um, was expressed how much she values seeing these examples and learning about Black language. At the time, many participants indicated concern that translanguaging might be a barrier rather than a bridge. Even though Dr. Gomez showed how students wrote more and demonstrated strengths in their writing, uh, students, she, she explained how students in her program often were not writing in a classroom, um, but they were because that they were in this after school program where they were uh, invited to you know, write about topics of their interest and use their own, uh, use their full linguistic repertoire, they were highly engaged um, productive writers. Kim, one of the participants in our project responded um, that this was really critical, getting students to start writing. However, she, along with the school principal, shared concerns about holding students back by allowing them to translanguage, which is a flexible use of, of um, using their full linguistic repertoire, such as English or Chinglish. Um, or letting them use their primary language or Black language. In the reflective surveys after the session, some of the teacher participants shared questions about language instruction that I have um, on the bottom of the slide and concerns that students might not develop strong English skills, showing a belief that there is a binary of either or, um, rather than um, recognizing that these fluid language practices are, are part of their everyday use of language. So grappling with language ideologies and racial linguistic perspectives has been a common thread and focus of meaningful discussion and interrogation in our monthly sessions. There's been a growing shift towards more expansive language ideologies, which is necessary for culturally and linguistically sustaining writing instruction. Here, um, Eva shares uh, from our September, during our September 25th meeting, uh, we're discussing the Gomez and Collins article, Who Gets, Who Gets to Count as Emerging Bilinguals. Um, and so she uh, shares her epiphany about racialized language use, something that she has come to as a, uh, as a result of reflecting on multiple sources. So I kind of had an aha moment where I saw different articles, the things that I've read before kind of come together. But mostly it was, I think it was on page 225, when they talked about like, the capitalization of using African American language as a way to make money for the NFL um, and with the expression we're ready. And I'm going to compare this with something I saw on Instagram and um, in a podcast that I listened to, 
what's something that's classy if you're white but trash if you're brown? And one of them was being bilingual. So, so she tied this also to the, this podcast, uh, Nice White Parents, that is cherished. It's a cherished thing if uh, you're bilingual, uh, but only if you're white and only if you're using languages such as French. Or, you know, and she also put, pointed out that it's a double-sided coin. For some people, it's considered very classy to be bilingual and others, it's considered trashy. And so this really kind of helped to really see these connections about how white corporations are profiting off the commodification of black language, but simultaneously routinely cracking down on and belittling systematically trying to oppress people of color. And so here she's really um, starting to uh, develop this critical perspective um, and understanding this intersection of race and languaging. And so she talks about how, um, you know, these athletes, you know, are being showcased to make money um, and they are kids heroes and they're used on this public platform, but yet they're not being valued or respected as individuals. And she's also talked about um, Kaepernick's protests of, um, to kneeling for the national uh, refusal to, um, to um, stand up for the national anthem. And how can we instill in our students that they're welcomed and valued and that you know the languages that they use are important, right? And so she's highlighting these contradictions uh, between mainstream media and, um, and standardized expectations in schools. Contrastly, Kim, the instructional coach, shared how she is wrestling with this idea of validating non-standard English um, use. She, like many educators with good intentions, is concerned that teachers and schools will not prepare students for the white world if teachers and the curriculum validate home and community-based languaging practices, right? So she's conflicted about incorporating, yet she thinks it's valuable and valid. So Nicole, another, um, she's a third grade teacher, she responds, she's a Latinx, um, and she draws on her own experiences. Um, and so she also ref, um, reflects on um, the importance of learning about the longstanding history of AAL, African American language. And she said, I mean, I was educated to believe that it's slang and that's how we really talk and there's a proper way to speak. And even though I was raised only speaking one language, it was always like, well, you sound like an English language learner because of how I was raised. So she's sharing her own personal experience of being um, linguistically marginalized and racialized. And so, oh, you're not speaking correctly. And so I don't know, I kind of feel like language is always changing and it's being influenced by culture, especially in America. I just feel like this is just another shift in language and that's moving forward. It was just eye-opening to see my own preconceived notions of language and how I use it in the classroom and what my expectations are of students. So it was very challenging for me and I had to really just think about my approach and how I communicate those expectations to students and what messages am I sending to them when I'm correcting or saying that's not proper English. Uh, and so she explained how this article really pushed her to be reflective um, on her own ideologies and her teaching, right? How she's positioning um, students based on their language and practices. So, um, so right now, in terms of my thoughts on what uh, these emerging patterns, again, this self-reflexive inquiry into one's own experiences and beliefs about language and literacy are important if the goal is to teach literacy in culturally and linguistically sustaining ways. Um, and critical inquiry for asset-based literacy pedagogy requires troubling preconceived notions and expanding ideas about languaging and literacy practices. And so that's something that um, is visible across the study I shared earlier with the secondary teachers, um, and then also with these elementary teachers. Critical asset-focused teacher inquiry is supported by multiple tools and processes and resources, including literature and colleagues. Um, it requires sustained reflection and analysis for learning over time and within the local context, which centers learners and, and centers the teachers. And so, um, you know, this project that I'm currently working on, we started in July. And you know, so this gradual shifting of ideologies and pedagogy, it takes time, it takes support, um, and it takes, you know, examination and reflection. So 
I'm going to end my presentation here. And I thank you so much for inviting me. I look forward to um, questions. Here is also my email address um, if you'd like to get in touch with me.